in everybody's interest that we all speak a common language. And that, so I'm not in favour of dogmatic multiculturalism, which I think is already a pretty dead horse, but gets flogged nonetheless. But the idea that you, it's, 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 um, you should encourage people to stick to their minority cultures and that somehow they're um, uh, selling out if they adopt the culture of, of, uh, of the country of their birth. And so loyalty in language, no, I, I entirely go along with that. I have a, a, a comment and, and perhaps a, and a question and, and, and sort of a challenge. One comment is history. Um, yes, it would be good to think that uh, history is on our side, that things are progressively getting better, and so we should give it time. Uh, I would not disagree, and I think as far as, as probably the majority of people is concerned, even as intellectuals um, get up and, and um, uh, emit a huge amount of hot air uh, on the ground, in fact, uh, people are integrating uh, pretty successfully. That's certainly true. But it's also true that, uh, as you yourself say, that the very people who cause the greatest damage, uh, uh, revolutionaries who bomb uh, undergrounds and so on, are people who have learned the language and have gone through a Western education and so on. It's not those first immigrants who come here from their villages and have all kinds of views on uh, women and men and so on, which may not be um, uh, match the consensus, the liberal consensus of modern Western society. It's their children. Uh, and grandchildren uh, who are causing the problems. So um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a slight tension there, which is not to say that their grandchildren will be the same as they are again. I mean, it may be a problem of the second generation particularly, and possibly the third, that it's in that transition period when people feel alienated from the rural cultures, uh, non-Western cultures of their parents, but not accepted yet by the country of their birth. And so in that no-man's land... They're particularly vulnerable to violent ideology. I mean, that, and that it, that'll gradually get better, possibly. Um, the second thing, this is more a question. Um, you say you have to, the only way to convince Muslims, or uh, I mean, any um, religious community, but to, we're talking about Muslims, to change in a self critical uh, attitude is to argue within the faith, as it were. But uh, as Sarkozy also knew perfectly well, uh, the stoning of adulterous woman, women is not a problem in France. It's a problem in countries where neither you nor cycles you have any influence. So uh, to say uh, I should uh, um, influence my fellow believers into changing, you're really talking to people, not in France or in Europe, but you're talking to people in places like Saudi Arabia or Iran um, who are really living in a, in a, in a from our perspective, in an isolated world. Now, to what extent, um, if uh, Islam, the Islam that you advocate as a European Muslim, where is the breaking point? I mean, is there a, uh, a point that this, can, this will lead to a schism? As a lot of people are talking about a European Islam. Um, with, at what point does this lead to a schism with the Islam as it is promoted, uh, not only, of course, in Saudi Arabia, but alas, uh, all over the world, um, sponsored largely by Saudi Arabia, but with that kind of Islam, and because the, the two would seem to start to diverge seriously if uh, we have the kind of Islam that I think that you would like to promote yourself. Thirdly, this question of respect. Um, uh, I think that there are, I mean, none of us would disagree that respect is important in, in, in the sort of grey area of informal rules of discourse which are not um, covered by law. I think this is very important. And I think that one thing that people um, often confuse is uh, the two verbs, to offend and to insult. Uh, in Dutch, kvetse and beleg. These are two different things. I don't think you can... If you talk about feelings and respecting people's feelings and so on, we're really talking about um, uh, offend and not insult. To, to, uh, it, it's very... It, you can say something entirely... You can say something critical but meant in respect and it'll still insult, uh, offend people's feelings. I don't think you can, either through legislation or informal rules or any other 
way in a democracy to protect people's feelings in that sense. Because people, people are going to be offended, by, of, have their feelings offended by all kinds of statements which may be not only legitimate but true. I think what you can say is that you encourage in uh, discourse that people should not insult, which is a deliberate attempt to hurt people's feelings and not saying something that might hurt people's feelings because they take offense. I think those are, it's important to, uh, to separate uh, uh, those two things and I don't think you can demand of people that they, that they pay respect, I think there's a limit to that, to things that they genuinely think are abhorrent. You can't say, um, well, there are these religious people who think stoning, stoning an adulterous woman is fine, and we should respect that because this is their religion, or here's a person who's um, killed uh, his niece because she went out with a, a boyfriend um, that the parents disapproved of and is considered to be an, ins an insult to male honour. We can't say, well, we, have to res we don't agree with it, but we should respect it. I, don't think that's, I think that's a step too far. I, the, I think their people should be entitled to say exactly what they think. Okay, so three comments and, and questions. So just one thing about the, the, the first question, because you are right, I think uh, the second generation was more exposed uh, to this political attitudes that we had with you know, people being involved in, in you know, the September, September 11th or, or uh, July 7th or in Madrid or in Bali or because we also have to when we speak about this it's not only in the West that things are happening in Morocco in Bali and, uh, very much you know uh, shocked by the way people are just thinking about oh it happened in the West so it's a problem when it happens to you know what is happening now in Iraq on a daily basis where it's people being killed and innocent people with the same mindset if people are saying this is Islamically right this also has to be uh, have to be condemned the point is that this is exactly what we have to, to, uh, to tackle as a problem is when people are saying, no, it's not religious, it's political, I say they are wrong. And when the people are saying it's religious and not political, I say it's wrong. It's both at the same time. This is what, as you know, a Muslim scholar living in the West or dealing with you know, contemporary Islamic issues, for example, say, we need to tackle this as a very deep religious question because some are quoting verses of the Quran and saying this is Islamically accepted or uh, acceptable. I, I would say, no, this is religious. So we have to tackle the religious discourse from within, as I said, but we also have to deal with the political understanding, which is a very simplistic still articulated discourse, I'm always you know, referring to Ayman al-Zawahri saying, you know, we try to educate the people, the bottom-up strategy, we failed, we tried to change the, the, the president in our country, we failed, we killed uh, Sadat, we had worse than him, so now we have to kill the people who are supporting uh, uh, the system, so this is in Washington, this is in New York. So. There is a logic, but it's very simplistic and wrong politics, and this is what we have to challenge. So I would say that this is why we have to deal with young generation at that level, which is a double work of how are you going to help the oppressed people around the world by being involved in democratic uh, societies, by voting, and at the same time advocating more democracy in Muslim-majority countries, because this is, the, this is also something which is important. Consistency is not democracy here, whatever there, and we deal with dictatorships because for the sake of our geostrategic interest, we also, and this is the way I'm lo uh, critically loyal to my country, that's fine to be for democracy here, and this is right, but we have to deal with democracies there and try to advocate democratization even in Saudi Arabia and petrol monarchies. We don't have to, to, to forget our principles because they have the money. Which, by the way, is exactly what Sarkozy was telling me. He was, and this is the second point about you know uh, uh, the moratorium. He was not speaking about France. In fact, our dis discussion would have, should have been on the suburbs and you know Islam and laicity. He started speaking about anti-Semitism, about my brother, and then about Stoning. It had nothing to do with our reality because he didn't want to speak about that. And then at the end, he was saying, "Oh, double took." But today he's telling us that Saudi Arabia is a moderate country and this is good. Okay, they are, they are implementing stoning, but it's a, a good country. So it's a political game. And this is where there is a lack of consistency. 
And my point was, I'm not only talking to him. I know that I'm talking to Muslims here and there. And my point, my, you know, my endeavor here, and my project is 